to everybody knows we're streaming on Facebook. Facebook will be with you in a moment. Participants are entering the room and we're going to get ourselves started here in just a second. All righty, and I'm going to switch to my screen share and you should all be seeing my screen now. Good evening, everybody. It is September 29th, 2022, which also means it's World Heart Day. So happy World Heart Day to all who are viewing us on Facebook. If you are watching us on Facebook, um, I'm here to tell you that we will be live streaming through about 8.30 this evening with this presentation. And if you want to join the room, you can go to the HCMA's website, 4hsam.org, or one of my staff will drop the link in the, uh, in the Facebook lead, uh, feed. And you will have an opportunity to ask questions in the Zoom room only. We will not be taking questions from Facebook. And we may not be that responsive to your comments because we're busy in the Zoom room right now as having a webinar. If you're joining us in the Zoom room and you're just loading in, we're going to be launching a survey in just a few seconds. And we're going to ask you to take that survey throughout the evening. And before we get into the talks from our wonderful team tonight, we will have the opportunity to kind of review who is here, where you're from, what point of view you're coming from, and what questions are on your mind today as they relate to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So I am going to introduce you to some of our team and just kind of put that slide up there so you didn't have to look at the Brady Bunch view for the whole time. <laughs> so thanks for joining. We have a couple of people joining and we have five attendees already. So it's early and they will start joining as the night goes on. Julie, want to just keep an eye on those phone lines and the emails if anybody has a problem logging in. They're not going to hear me say, call Julie, but they'll reach out to you. So this program tonight is going to be featuring Brigham and Women's team on their HCM program. And there's some pretty um, notable names in HCM here with us tonight, and we're really pleased to have them here. Uh, but I have my team as well. So I'm going to introduce my team, and then I'm going to hand it over to Neil, who's going to introduce the Brigham team. So Julie Russo, waving Julie is our volunteer coordinator and one of the assistants on the Big Hearted Warrior Tour organization team. And if you want to volunteer with the HCMA, Julie will be there to assist you in anything that you want to do. Stacy Titus is our Center of Excellence coordinator and she works with our onboarding centers as well as our established centers to maintain communication and make sure everybody's on the same page. So you might not see her if you're a patient too much, but if you're one of our centers, you're gonna to get to know Stacy better over the years. So that is the team that we have here from the HCMA today. And Neil, why don't you tell us who's here with us tonight and what we can expect from this team this evening. Super, thank you, Lisa. We're really excited to be here and, and very pleased for the invitation. So um, with me tonight um, are Allison Serino. So Allison, um, many of you have gotten to know over the last several years is a very skilled genetic counselor and uh, knower and doer of all things in, in the world of cardiovascular genetics. Um, uh, Cricket Seidman, I think, truly needs no introduction, but I'll, I'll make a really uh, uh, brief version of that, and then we're gonna actually review a little bit more of uh, Cricket of history um, in just a moment, but Cricket leads the cardiovascular genetics program at the Brigham um, and has made so many um, key discoveries in this field that, that I would not have time to talk about them tonight. Uh, but I'll try to touch on a few. And then um, Carolyn Ho, who has um, been the medical director of the HCM program um, and has really led the translation of a lot of fundamental basic discovery to, to the bedside um, in the form of clinical trials and very important observations. And dear friend and mentor of mine, and I'm so uh, honored to share the days with the three of them. And then of course, with uh, you as well, Lisa. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to jump into a very quick overview talk, which is kind of a new slide deck for me because I was just recreating it. So uh, there might be, you know, new slide decks are always fun, but we wanted to share some information with you all about the HCMA and our work and how we accomplish the goals and objectives we set for ourselves. And in that, we can teach you about some of our programs. So I'm going to go really quickly here. Um, 
with a couple of other items. Hmm. Oh, that's what's going on there. Okay, so this is the agenda for tonight. So we're going to be talking about patient-centered management, genetics, cardiac myosin inhibitors, hot topic of the year. And we're going to be looking at highlights um, on research and some papers of interest. We want to thank our sponsors tonight, which are Boston Scientific, Invitae, Bristol-Myers Squibb, and Cytokinetics. Um, we have other partners on other projects you're going to learn about in a little bit, but it's these partners that make this particular program possible. So thank you to all of our sponsors. So overview of who is the HCMA. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization founded in 1996. We operate through a board of directors and committees to do our work. Some of the committees are being built out right now, and we are currently recruiting for members of our health equity and finance committee. So if you're interested, Julie can help you get signed up for those opportunities. What is our vision? Simple. We want to be the preeminent organization to improve the lives of those with HCM, preventing untimely deaths, and advancing global understanding. How are we doing that? Through our mission, by providing support, advocacy, and education to patients, families, the medical community, and the public about HCM, while supporting research and fostering the development of treatments. It sounds so simple, doesn't it? But how do we do this? We do this through a number of steps. So we educate people, these are our objectives. We educate people about the symptoms and treatment options for patients or families, as well as medical providers. And we do that through a number of different programs. We have our HCMA office staff, which we also run through our, our intake process, our navigation process, our online support systems. We have live answered phones from nine in the morning till seven at night Eastern time now. So you can always get somebody to guide you and listen. We have our website and so many other opportunities for connection through social media, et cetera. We are guided by our patient education committee and then vetted through our medical affairs committee. And that's how we provide this information to you. We do it also through Tales from the Heart, the podcast from the HCMA, and we bring in thought leaders, industry leaders, authors, and all kinds of different people and patients um, with experiences in HCM to help educate in a different way and a more, more uh, entertaining way, I guess. We also have the Big Hearted Warrior Tour, which you're participating in right now. Additionally, on the medical education side, we've partnered with PCM Scientific for HCM Academy to provide free CME courses for medical professionals looking to learn more about HCM. We're very excited to be heading into year two of this program, which will bring some changes, but we hope to reach a lot of people with HCM Academy. Our second objective is to advocate for policy and legislation that improves the disease detection, healthcare access, and general matters of importance to the HCM community. We do this under the Elizabeth T. McNamee Legislative Advocacy Committee, and we currently have a project underway called the Healthy Cardiac Monitoring Act, in which we hope to bring cardiac components to well-child examinations and improve sports physicals for all children in America, not just athletes. We want to get all children, which then gets us to all families. So they have the opportunity to have a discussion with their chosen healthcare provider about what their individual mm -hmm. family risks are and what tests that they should have done mm -hmm. to see if there's anything else going on there. If my faculty could mute their mics, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. We also participated in, or actually led, an externally led patient-focused drug development meeting with the FDA back in 2020. The whole, the whole program is available on our website and on our YouTube channel. And we created something called the Voice of the Patient Report, which was a synopsis of what you, the patients, were telling the FDA you wanted, needed, and the burden of disease, and what your hopes were for the future. And this report has been cited in many FDA applications already, and hopefully more to come. So your voice mattered, and thank you for those who participated in the PFDD back in 2020. That was fun to try to do at the beginning of the pandemic. <clears throat> what else are we trying to do? Third objective, to develop and maintain a network of support for individuals and families with HCM. We do that with multiple sessions every week of live online support groups and discussion groups where you can participate and hear from your peers and meet other people with HCM, share experiences and best practices. Additionally, we have our HCMA Center of Excellence programming. So this 
many of our programs have individual support groups on the ground. They have support services there for you. And our partnership with these centers allows us to have a greater reach into the patient's uh, daily lives. We have a very active social media following. As many of you know, you follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, and even pick up your uh, podcast on Spotify or iTunes. We are building out nation-specific support group prop processes through our Facebook communities, and uh, we'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. And again, the office is here to answer your calls, do your navigations, provide the online support organize regional meetings, and our message board archive, which has been active since 1999, has only launched it. So it's the only time I get to use a 19 other than our founding year. But there's a great deal of information in those archives. There's probably, I think, uh, 150,000 threads of data from patients sharing their experiences. So it's still out there. We haven't sunsetted it. I keep threatening to, but I haven't done it yet. It's an inf interesting source of information. And we also have the Lori Fund, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about later. But this helps patients get to this care and find these opportunities. I'll talk about that in a moment. So this is what our Facebook page looks like at the header. And then our tagged groups, <clears throat> excuse me, which are private groups. And I use my air quotes on the word private because right now our larger group has almost 9,000 participants. So you're sharing it privately with other people with HCM, it does not show up on your Facebook feed so that other people can see what you're posting there. So it's caught, it's uh, private in that sense. The HCM Swedish Society, this is their group. We started this page about a year ago. It was six or seven people to start. There are several hundred there now, so much so that they have found enough collaboration that they started their own charity and we're really excited for them. We're also working with our partners in the Netherlands and we link to their Facebook page as well. And we're building out other countries so people can speak in their native language and get support from their peers and guidance there, as well as other services each of these countries will be offering. And again, we have our, our discussion groups moderated by trained patient advocates. Our fourth objective is to increase the accessibility to specialized care, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with evidence-based treatment of HCM. This is our HCMA recognized center of excellence program. You can get all the details on that on our website. We formally established this in 2005. We were working with some programs before that, but the program has evolved over the years. Um, our original goal was to have care within a five hour drive of most Americans. If you're on the East Coast, we've definitely got you covered. I've got some work to do in the Midwest and the West Coast, but we're getting there. Um, it was modeled after the best clinical practices and the needs and desires of patients and families. And in 2020, the guidelines rec recognized this model of care as the best model of care for those with HCM. On January 9th of 2022, we kicked off a new project called the Lori Fund, which provides micro grants to families looking for HCMA recognized center of excellence care, but they don't have the financial resources to get there. This will pay for a plane ticket, hotel rooms, gas money, ground transportation, to help families get to Center of Excellence Care. Um, the application went live a week ago and we approved our first micro grant this week. So it's kind of a, an, an important and fun week here at the HCMA, we're doing new things. It's great. Um, and Lori, for those who don't know, was my sister. So it's nice to have her name on a project in perpetuity, we hope. Um, this is what our Center of Excellence map looks like now. Um, we have very, very large programs. I'm still working on some of my hearts. There was a little bit of a glitch on this. So I, I apologize to those who don't have their hearts right yet. But as of right now, we estimate that there are about 55,000 patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy currently in care at one of these programs. The gray dots and the pink dots are programs under evaluation or an application is in process. And right now we have 46 programs in total around the country. And uh, we're trying to go out of the country now too. So we'll talk more about that in future events. Um, we wanna promote and publish research on HCM and broaden access to the results with the ultimate goal of eradicating the disease. And I think we're gonna hear a little bit about that later tonight, we hope. So in H the HCMA registry of patient experiences, which is very different than the share registry and very different than other registries, because it's what we've learned here at the HCMA over the past 26 years. 
We are moving that into a red cap system where we will have IRB oversight on it shortly. And we might be able to start doing some interesting research work out of that. And you'll all be able to consent in. Stay tuned for more information there. That is going to be handled under the uh, direction of the HCMA's Medical Affairs Committee. We have a great filter on our website from a company called Antidote, which is a clinical trial tracker. It's already pre-populated for HCM. You just have to put in your zip code and you can find a clinical trial near you at any time you want. We have webinars that we provide and podcasts where we talk about clinical trials and research discoveries and more. We're trying to add to that because there's a lot to talk about these days. Um, we were previously on the faculty of the FDA Clinical Trial Training Program, explaining how patient advocacy can be a help to recruit for clinical trials and for um, general awareness about the need for clinical trials. Um, and we've published many findings. In fact, we have a poster uh, tomorrow at HSFA uh, with a lot of the colleagues uh, from the HCM Society. Uh, so that's a really exciting development as well. These are our partners. We can't do anything in a silo. We need to work with our partners. And I'm very happy to say that we have a lot of partners. There's a couple that didn't quite get on the slide yet. Sorry, but we're getting there. Um, and we're going to be doing a great project this year at the American Heart Association Scientific Sessions uh, that we just kind of nailed down today. We've got a great panel. We've got a media opportunity. And all of this is available in part because industry has finally found us. We were kind of lost for a while out there without any great therapeutic pathways. Now we have them and that brings more industry partners to the table as well. We are a proud member of the Cardiomyopathy Council of the Global Heart Hub and I'm a proud um, board member of the new HCM Society. So all of these collaborations are going to help us do what we need to do here for the HCMA and the HCM community. We're building the future through a new program called HCM International, which if you look at all the bullets here, I'm just going to stick with the last one for tonight. We're looking to identify and engage passionate patients, clinicians, providers, societies, uh, government agencies, and industry partners to improve awareness, diagnosis, and management of HCM worldwide. Not every country has the same access to health care. Not every country has the same access to the internet. So we have to work within those nations to develop programs that work for their nation, their culture, their language, and we're going to be happy to help provide them with patient education, and they will translate, and we're, we've already done it with Sweden. And this is what all the logos are going to look like when we start launching our mini HCMAs all over the place. So this is the Swedish group, and Lotus and Marianne are great patient advocates. Um, we've already got them uh, set up to speak at uh, a conference next week where I will be as well, Focus Patient in Sweden, in Stockholm, and we're really excited about that opportunity. And it took three years to get the first one off the ground. I'm hoping the next country we can do in a little bit less time than that. And we have a great uh, collaborator and a contractor that's helping us get that work done. This does not happen in a vacuum, people. This is not one person. We have an amazing staff and contractors here at the HCMA that are making all of these things happen at a faster pace than ever, a phenomenal board. And in 2021 to 2022, in the, in the past 12 months, we have had over 100 dedicated volunteers donating their time, resources, stories, abilities, skills to the HCMA to make us stronger and better and be here to serve you, the patients and the community in all things we need for HCM care. So I want to thank our HCM team at Brigham and Women's, all of our staff contractors, our board, our partners, our sponsors, our donors, all those volunteers, but not least of which, Brandy, my heart donor, for without whom I would not be with you here today. And I am happy to be here with you here today on World Heart Day. So on that note, that gives you the update on everything that's going on here at the HCMA. That's the first time that talk has been given in public, um, but I hope it brings to light all of the programs that we provide here and how we can all be working together to build a better tomorrow. So I'm going to hand it off to Neil, who is going to give his presentation, which will probably be a lot more interesting than mine. <laughs> You're on mute, Neil. All right. There you go. Look at that. Okay.
Well, Lisa, thank you so much. Thanks for, again for the invitation. And I apologize that my nails are not um, appropriately painted to celebrate um, this festive day, World Heart Day. Um, I, I did a little bit of team introductions and uh, what I'm hoping to do during my presentation is to introduce team members, including those who are speaking tonight, and then key members of our team who um, uh, are relevant to what we're trying to do. Um, I'm going to briefly touch on what I think are the path-breaking contributions made by um, our HCM team members at the Brigham. And then I'm going to talk about one area of inquiry that I think is a broad interest, it's very patient-focused, and it's hard to have HCM or know someone with HCM and have this particular area be irrelevant. So here's our team. I did introduce already um, Drs. Ho, Seidman, um, and Allison Serena. I'll just say one note about myself. The other hat that I wear is of um, heart failure and cardiac transplant. Um, on the bottom rows are my colleagues, uh, Dr. Hari Malidi. He is our surgical director, also um, a transplant surgeon. And you may know him from um, some of the big hearted warrior uh, tours of uh, the West Coast. He had been the principal myectomy operator at Stanford for many years before he joined the Brigham several years ago. My uh, good friend and colleague, Eric Stewart, also um, does heart failure transplant, and um, we're thrilled to have him on the HCM team. Dr. Abrams, although based principally at Boston Children's Hospital, um, has helped to, to develop an innovative family clinic um, and spans both sides of the Boston, uh, Brigham and Women's and Boston Children's Bridge. We're very excited for him to be on the team. And um, I mentioned Allison Serena, who uh, I've been so thrilled to have worked with for the last 15, 16 years. Um, our team has um, two um, outstanding genetic counselors at the helm. Um, Nadine Shanui is the other. Um, Nadine's currently on parental leave, but um, will be back soon. And a few other team members I haven't listed, including Chelsea Stevens, um, I'd highlight as a, a, another outstanding genetic counselor with our team. So um, the uh, Brigham staff have been focused on HCM before there was an HCM. And I think many of you will recognize this picture of Dr. Bronwald dating to his time at the uh, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute when he was at the NIH in the 50s and in the 60s when he basically described the pathophysiology of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And in, in a bit of a historical detour, I just wanted to just verbatim quote some of his observations from a 1960, um, very important article he wrote in circulation. At the time it was an HCM, it was idiopathic hypertrophic subaortic stenosis, which he said, quote, unquote, was a disease characterized by marked hypertrophy of the left ventricle, involving in particular the interventricular septum and the left ventricular outflow tract. And that during systole, the hypertrophy muscle in the outflow tract often narrows this region sufficiently to produce obstruction to left ventricular ejection. So, so there in a pithy paragraph, he describes what so much has, uh, what so many of us have um, uh, seen clinically, and this was long before we had two-dimensional echo or MRI. Um, he, working with his colleagues in pathology, described the microscopic findings of muscle bundles in the left ventricle, which were often arranged in a bizarre fashion and are separated by class. And uh, in that 1960 description, one of his uh, concluding comments was that the etiology of IHSS or HCM as we know it today has not been defined. So um, this is just one of the many um, groundbreaking observations made by Dr. Brunwald to the entire field of cardiovascular medicine. Dr. Brunwald went on to become the chairman of medicine here at Brigham and Women's Hospital and still is a key investigator. Um, I'm just showing the building that's been renamed uh, the Brunwell Tower here uh, in, in uh, appropriate appreciation of his many contributions. But picking up on the theme of the etiology not being defined, um, we've learned that it is defined. It's defined as a disease of the cardiac sarcomere or the molecular motor of the heart. And that's where um, Dr. Seidman um, and her husband, John Seidman, enter um, this brief historical uh, tour. So in the late 80s, um, through very careful studies and families, she was able to describe the genetic basis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. First, in um, families who harbored a change in the gene, which encodes one of the thick filaments of the cardiac sarcomere, the molecular motor of the heart. 
and then uh, moved on to um, include the thin filaments. And the cartoon that I've shown here um, summarizes um, the, the key molecular components that um, are affected in, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And while this is just the beginning of their scientific journey and so much has happened since then, um, one of the, the important observations that came from this is that people have sarcomere gene mutations before they develop hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And that's um, where um, Dr. Ho enters the, the historical detour. So Dr. Ho started by describing what's going on in the hearts of people who have these sarcomere gene mutations before they develop HCM, before there's obvious left ventricular hypertrophy. And that led to a series of clinical trials where she has started her effort to either prevent or attenuate hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So using genetics to try to stop the full expression of the disease. The first pass of this was to use a common uh, medication, a calcium channel blocker deltaism. And based on studies in mice, there was the hope that this could uh, prevent the development of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And, in a nutshell, it showed a little bit of promise, but not the effect that um, we had hoped for. Um, more recently, Dr. Ho um, examined the effect of Valsartan, another commonly used cardiovascular medicine in people with very early hypertrophic cardiomyopathy caused by sarcomere gene mutations, and showed the potential for an impact on um, disease progression. And so I've just shown two um, figures from um, this paper that was published uh, very recently on the left is a measure of left ventricular wall thickness. And uh, on the, on the y-axis, there's a body surface area adjusted maximal wall thickness. So don't take this as millimeters. This is millimeters divided by how big people are. Uh, the red line depicts the change in wall thickness in people who got Valsartan and the blue line, people who got placebo. And in the Valsartan group, uh, wall thickness was stable, whereas in the placebo group, we saw an increase in wall thickness. Um, similarly, um, she showed that diastolic function or the ability of the heart muscle to relax um, was maintained in people who received Valsartan, uh, while it worsened in people who received placebo. Now, this was a phase two uh, pilot study. More work to be done, but it's a uh, a, a nice example of how we can try to get ahead of this disease. And so I want to shift now and, and um, talk about what I consider to be a, a, a patient-centered, very um, relevant topic that's a little bit closer to what I've been doing. And um, chances are either you or someone you know is a woman. And um, maybe it, uh, if you're on this webinar, chances are that woman has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So why does this 40%, why am I magnifying 40%? Why is 40% so um, relevant to that particular um, uh, demographic? Well, that's because in almost every hypertrophic cardiomyopathy description to date, women are underrepresented. Um, from the earliest clinical descriptions to recent large center series of people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, women account for 30 to 40% of the patients seen in centers. Um, through work that um, was doable, was possible um, using the SHARE registry, um, a registry um, launched by Dr. Ho, where um, a number of HCM centers around the world have um, combined efforts to make new insights into this disease. We saw that um, we, we also um, had less than 50% of our patients um, as women. And uh, importantly, that the distribution of men and women patients varied throughout the world. In the US, it was closer to about 40%, and in Europe was closer to about 35%, indicating that there may be something other than just biology that explains why women are underrepresented in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy centers. We wondered um, if it's because access to care may differ for um, men and women. Maybe it's because um, primary care physicians or general cardiologists aren't recognizing HCM symptoms in their female patients. 
and therefore aren't referring them to centers of excellence. Um, or maybe it's an issue of how we go about diagnosing HCM in men and women. It, it is one size fits all, and um, is it an institutional problem? Or might it be that women are less likely to go on and manifest hypertrophic cardiomyopathy than men? Is there a biological reason for this? And there are some early studies to suggest that penetrance, that measure of how likely a gene mutation is to go on and cause disease may be lower in women than in men. We tried to drill down a little bit more in, into the share population to understand this. And so we learned that women with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy were older when they were diagnosed, uh, and they were more likely to have a sarcomere gene mutation. So on the figure that I've highlighted here, the, the blue lines account for the number of men diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy at a particular age. The age um, is on the x-axis. And the average age that a man was diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the share population was about 40 years. In pink, we represent women, and women on average were diagnosed at 46 years of age with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, on the <clears throat> figure on the right, they show that women with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, had a sarcomere gene mutation 51% of the time, as opposed to men, where a sarcomere gene mutation was present 43% of the time. This may not seem like a big difference, but it was highly statistically significant. And this finding has been seen in other groups. So why are we seeing more sarcomere gene mutations in women than men with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? We drilled down even further into this question to understand how, how at what age women and men are diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy based on their genetics. If we look at people with HCM who have genetic testing in whom we could not find a sarcomere gene mutation, um, women were on average 53 years of age compared to men who were on average about 46 years of age at the time of diagnosis. So about a seven year difference in the age of diagnosis. When we look at people who have a sarcomere gene mutation, first off, you can see they're considerably younger. Women were 38 and change and men were 35 and change. So that difference in age and diagnosis shrinks quite a bit when you look at people who have a sarcomere gene mutation. And then when we parsed it down by the, the gene associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in these individuals, these um, changes um, became even more interesting. If we look at the most commonly involved gene in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, MYBPC3, women were on average 41 and a half compared to men who were 36 at the age of diagnosis. So again, a pretty significant difference between men and women at the age of diagnosis. Compared to the other thick filament gene, myosin heavy chain, and here there was really no difference in the age of diagnosis between men and women, 34 and 33, and not statistically significant. Uh, all of this arguing that, yeah, there's probably some societal reasons for why women are um, older and less frequently diagnosed and then referred for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy care at a center of excellence. Um, but there's also some biological differences there. It, beyond the causes of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, women with HCM, um, bear the brunt of more severe complications. They're more likely to die if they have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and more likely to develop advanced heart failure. We found a 45% increased risk of death in women with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy compared to men when we started at their age of diagnosis. And um, a very significant increase in the likelihood that a woman with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy would develop severe heart failure symptoms. So, Class three or class four um, effectively identifies people who are so symptomatic that doing day-to-day -day activities is limited by shortness of breath, by chest discomfort, by lightheadedness. This is when heart disease has a very pervasive effect on your, on your um, quality of life. Women were 87% more likely to experience this than men. So where do we go from here when, when considering sex-based disparities in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Um, I, I, I've just posited a couple um, directions that this could go. So one is um, we should include 
sex is a variable in model system studies. And so when we look at animals that are um, engineered to have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or induced pluripotent stem cells where we grow heart tissue in a dish, we, we should try to have um, tissues and animals that represent both sexes. We also need to study the effect of sex hormones. And some of this um, is, is best studied in people, meaning that when we do large studies like we have in the share population, we need to gather more information about the key events in a woman's life where her um, sexual hormones um, go up and go down and understand if that has a relation um, to a course with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, from a diagnostic perspective, uh, I think we need to follow individuals prospectively, meaning um, see how they are now and then see how they are in the future before they have um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to understand if penetrance is really lower in women. And then along with this, um, uh, reassess the diagnostic thresholds. Should it really be that 15 millimeter threshold in women as it is in men um, for maximal wall thickness? Um, I think along with this is advocacy that improving access to specialized care for all of our patients is crucial and not just in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but throughout the continuum of cardiovascular disease, this has been um, a problem for the care of women that um, advocacy will, I think, help to address. And last, um, well, when we study interventions, septal reduction therapy, myosin inhibition, and other treatments for heart failure related to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we should uh, make it a point to understand how um, sex as a variable um, impacts the course of patients. So I will stop there and um, uh, pass it along or entertain any questions. Thanks, Lisa. I have a question. Please. <laughs> Well, it's, uh, I'm going to have you stop sharing your slides there for a second. It's more of an observation. And I think we have some interesting work to do here. Um, so center of excellence care, we know is critically important for lots of patients, but I'm seeing a slightly different demographic at the HCMA. And it's a lot, a lot more younger women being diagnosed, but aren't getting to the centers. So I think we should take a dive in once we get our, our, our systems in place and look at that, what's going on in the community versus what's going on in centers. And I think we might find some other additional educational opportunities there and some, maybe some work that we can do to bring pathways to these patients a little bit sooner. Um, that, that, was, that was really interesting. So thank you for that. Um, I don't see any questions in the queue right now, so you can use the question box here. And I'm going to, because I forgot it again, people, I forgot to launch the, the poll. I always do it. Um, so the poll can get answered by anybody who's there. Uh, you know, someday I'll be perfect. Today's not looking so hot. Okay, so next up, I believe we have Allison coming up. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. All right. So let me share my slides. So I'm going to take things in a different direction a little bit. So again, my name is Allison Storino. I um, am one of the genetic counselors working with the group at the Brigham and Women's HCM Clinic. And tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about genetic testing and family management and give you a sense of how we approach this and why. So we know that caring for a patient with inherited disease like HCM also involves addressing the implications for their family members. To that end, one of the initial steps we take is to gather family history. So we typically do this in the form of a pedigree to give us a visual representation of the family. So a picture of a pedigree is depicted on the slide here. Males are squares, females are circles. The red shading indicates that a person in this case has HCM. I tend to think of the pedigree as having two main goals. The first is that it can help us to learn about how the disease has presented in the family. And this information can be really helpful and can be incorporated into the care and treatment plan that we have for the person that's there in clinic in front of us. And second, it can help us to understand the structure of the family in order to identify family members who are at risk to develop HCM. In this case, those are individuals who are denoted with the red arrows. 
So we determine who's at risk for HCM based on our understanding of how HCM is passed through families. And we know that this is an autosomal dominant condition. So as a very quick reminder, we have two copies of most of our genes. We've inherited one copy from each of our biological parents. And in the case of a dominant condition, one copy of that gene has a mutation or a variant, whatever terminology you'd like to use. And this um, is enough to disrupt how that gene works and put somebody at risk to develop the condition, in this case, HCM. When a person in that situation goes on to have children, they're either going to pass on the copy of the gene with the variant or not, and that gives a 50% chance of the condition being passed from one generation to the next. So based on this risk for close biological relatives, there are recommendations for first degree family members, and that's defined as parents, siblings, and children. And they're recommended to undergo longitudinal clinical evaluations with echocardiograms and EKGs. So the frequency of the follow-up is based on age. So here you can see the recommendations from the most recent AHA, ACC, HCM guidelines. And it's important that because HCM can develop at different points in lifetime, these evaluations really do need to be repeated periodically, essentially indefinitely. Um, one of the things I enjoy about our program a lot, which is uh, mentioned earlier, is our close collaboration with pediatric providers at Boston Children's Hospital. And this really helps us to collaborate and coordinate care for all the um, family members across the lifespan. So rather than having all those individuals with red arrows get longitudinal evaluation, is there a better way that we can determine who's really at risk so that the appropriate people are being screened and other people can be released from unnecessary screening? So this, for here, we can talk about the, the roles for genetic testing, because I think this is really where it can have an, a, a strong impact both for the patient and families. So this diagram is just to kind of depict the two main ways that we think about using genetic testing. So we'll start on the top with our blue stick figure with a red heart. It's intended to um, depict somebody with HCM. So if we have a person like that, we can undergo genetic testing to see if we can figure out the exact underlying genetic cause for their HCM. So if we do that and we find an answer that confirms the diagnosis, it helps establish what the genetic cause is. It may or may not be something that can impact their medical management now, but certainly this is an evolving area and, and that may change over time as more treatments emerge. This path is what we refer to as diagnostic genetic testing because we have a person and we're trying to make a genetic diagnosis that confirms what is a, a, an existing clinical diagnosis. One the very impactful way that we can then use this genetic information is what we call predictive genetic testing. And that's when we use this genetic knowledge and apply it in the family. So if we have an, a knowledge of the underlying genetic variant in the family, other family members can choose to undergo genetic testing themselves in a very targeted way where they're looking specifically for the DNA change that was already identified in their relative. Anyone who tests positive is at risk to develop HCM and therefore does in fact require that longitudinal follow-up. They also have that 50% chance to transmit it to the next generation. And there may be other individual considerations for that person like lifestyle modifications, reproductive planning, and other future life planning decisions. On the other hand, if somebody tests negative for a known DNA change in the family, it's, it can be very reassuring and that we don't feel that this person is at any increased risk to develop HCM, and it's not possible for them to pass it on to their children in this case. So these individuals and their children do not require longitudinal follow-up. With the important caveat, of course, that if somebody develops symptoms, it's always uh, prudent to seek medical management, to seek medical evaluation. So now we're kind of thinking about how, why we would do genetic testing, a pretty quick overview of what a, what process looks like in, in basic terms. If you're going to go through genetic testing, you have a pre-test genetic counseling conversation. If you decide to move forward, a, a blood or saliva sample is collected as the most common sources of DNA. These are sent off to specialized genetic testing labs that run the tests and analyze the results. These results are then sent back to the provider who orders the test, and that provider would have a, has a detailed conversation with you about what the results are and the implication of those results, and then makes recommendations for what information you should be sharing with your family so that we can make sure these individuals are informed of their risks and next steps that they might take. So just to talk a little bit more about what goes into some of these components, 
in pretest genetic counseling, I think you know one of the main points of this is to make sure that you are informed, you know all the details to make a decision. So in order for this to happen, it's really important that the person that you're seeing for this has a lot of knowledge and expertise about the genetic testing process because it is not as straightforward as other more standard laboratory testing. So these conversations can cover a variety of topics. Typically family history would be reviewed if that has not already happened. And in some cases that's helping to make sure that we're starting this testing process with the ideal person to test first in a family. We'll also review what types of testing we are recommending. There are decisions to be made there, fewer genes, more genes, one gene, looking at a variant. And, and these all have implications about the likelihood of getting a result, the types of results. So it's important to have a good handle on that upfront. We'd also discuss other benefits and limitations of testing and common logistical questions that people have about testing. So in the course of the conversation, there are also a variety of other topics that are important for people to consider when they're trying to decide whether or not they want to have genetic testing themselves. And the first thing that we always have to be mindful of is the fact that we may not find a definitive answer from genetic testing. We don't have a complete understanding of all the ways that our DNA can lead to disease. And so we are in a situation where sometimes we don't get that clear answer that people are seeking out or hoping for. And this can be um, an unsatisfying situation when this happens. If we do find a result, we may not be able to make any specific predictions about what somebody can expect in the future for themselves clinically or for somebody else in their family. And we may not be able to you know, tailor treatments based on a particular DNA change. It's also true that some people will experience negative emotional reactions to genetic testing. And this could include things like fear, anger, or sadness, or guilt. Um, but the good news is that typically these types of negative reactions do tend not to persist um, over time. And another element that can present itself is that the genetic testing process itself or the results can worsen um, existing tensions in families or create new ones. Um, we know that every family is a little bit different and individuals within families will make different decisions about whether or not they wanna be tested. Sometimes people are getting tested at the same time and getting different types of results. And these can lead to challenging family dynamics in some cases. And the last thing that's important to consider is that when we think about unaffected people who are thinking about genetic testing, there is you know, concern among people sometimes that there is the potential for discrimination with some types of insurance. So I wanted to just mention that again, um, mention that in a little more detail. Um, because of that concern that this, that fear of misuse of genetic information might be um, an obstacle to people using genetic testing, there were um, extensive efforts many years ago to put federal legislation in place. And this comes to us in the form of the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. It's abbreviated GINA more commonly. And this provides federal legal protections against discrimination based on predictive genetic information. And predictive genetic information is defined as both family history information as well as predictive genetic test results. So it stipulates that this information can't be considered a pre-existing condition. It also um, has implications in the employment space where it can't be used for hiring and promotion decisions and things like that. Unfortunately, the same federal legal protections aren't in place for other types of insurance like life insurance and long-term disability. However, there are some state level regulations in, in this space, um, but it is something that if somebody's particularly concerned about it, it's worth like an individual level conversation because there are some exceptions to Zena, like people who are employed by the military or work in particularly small companies. So if somebody's particularly concerned about um, about genetic discrimination. In some instances, these people make decisions to secure their desired types of insurance before going through testing. So if you do decide to go through with testing, you can anticipate that there would be a thorough discussion of your results once they become available. So this is typically done with a provider who's ordered the test and would incorporate a discussion about what, if anything, was found, and importantly, how confident we are that anything that is identified is truly the cause of disease in, the, in, in you and in potentially in the family. And this may not be a clear yes or no answer. So this is another reason why it can be really valuable to be getting your care in a center where there's a lot of expertise that can help navigate some of this um, um, decision making. So as part of the conversation, you'd be discussing the implications and next steps for you and your family, if any, and you would come out of this discussion with an understanding about whether or not there is a recommendation 
for predictive to, for the use of predictive genetic testing in other people in the family. This is often what people are seeking out with genetic testing. So it's important to know whether or not this is something that can be done in, um, it, or is being recommended for a particular family. And that's really, that decision about whether or not predictive genetic testing is recommended is really based on the result that comes back in the first person in the family. This idea of like, how confident are we that we know the cause of disease in the family? And do we feel comfortable using that to, to determine who else in the family is at risk? So if we have somebody, so to, to kind of quickly summarize the three main types of results we can get back, um, we may get a negative result. And when that happens in a person who has HCM, it means that we did not find a clear genetic cause for their disease. It doesn't rule out a genetic cause entirely, but it does mean that we don't have a strategy to use predictive genetic testing in the family because we don't have a, something that we can pinpoint to test other people for. On the other end of the spectrum, we might get a positive result, and this happens when there's a DNA variant identified where there's really enough evidence that we can feel comfortable and confident that this is the cause of disease in the family, in which case we're typically comfortable with other people, unaffected family members, using this for predictive genetic testing if they would like. There is also the kind of gray zone in the middle, the possibility that we could come back with a DNA variant of unknown or uncertain significance. And this happens when, when a DNA variant is identified, but there's simply not enough information available at the time to determine with any level of confidence whether or not this is truly the cause of disease in the person or whether or not it might represent more kind of harm, harmless, benign DNA variation that we know exists. In some cases, we can call upon other affected members of the, of the family. And this is another way that we really do rely and use family members in a process called segregation testing that I'll touch upon in a moment. And sometimes this can provide valuable information to help our understanding of disease. But until we feel more confident about the role that a DNA variant is playing, we don't rec typically recommend using it for predictive testing purposes to understand the risk to unaffected people because it's not going to provide clarity in that case. If we don't know what it means in the first person, we're not going to know what it means when we test subsequent unaffected family members. So I mentioned that sometimes we can kind of leverage the power of family if we have it. Um, if we have families where we have a lot of affected family members in this pedigree, that, that, that's what's represented with the, the black and shapes or a number of different people that have HCM. One thing that we can do is if we think a DNA variant is the cause of disease in a family, it should be present in all the people who have HCM. So if we have the ability, the luxury and the ability to test all these individuals and see that all of the individuals with a HCM also have a DNA variant, that is supportive evidence that a variant is the cause of disease and it just can help to you know, increase our confidence that we have truly landed on the cause of disease in a family. On the other hand, we could be in a situation where we have a person in a family where we have this like person who circles where they they have HCM to the best of our knowledge and don't test positive for the for the variant. And that can call, just call into question whether or not a particular variant is truly the cause of disease in the family or if it's the only cause of disease in the family. So all this is an effort to try to get as much clarity as we can about what this means for the person that we're testing and any subsequent family members so that this information can then be kind of bundled up and shared with other people in your family since we know that your diagnosis as well as genetic test results really have important implications for other family members. So there's going to be a recommendation to share this information and it's always you can always talk with providers about helpful tips or ways to discuss this information with your relatives. Again, you know, every family is different. Communication is easier for some families than others. There are tools that we can use or provide that would might help disseminate information through families that that can be helpful. Um, and it's always good to remember that your genetic testing report is Itself is a good source of information. So it's good for you to have a copy of this for your own records and passing that along to family members who are considering undergoing genetic testing is helpful because it can have all the information that another provider would need in, in, um, in order to order genetic testing in somebody else.
So my last plug is really just about the importance to stay in touch. Um, and this is because there are just changing changing information and information needs. And this may be for you. Your information needs may change over time. You may be the person circled here. You may go through genetic testing at an earlier point in life. And then fast forward a few years, you may be thinking about starting a family. And that may not have been relevant to you at the time you went through genetic testing. So it's important that you have current updated information about how you can use the genetic testing for your own purposes. You may also have family history updates are important for your providers to know. So always kind of remember to, to, to uh, send that information back as well. And then lastly, there can just be updates to genetic testing. If we find a variant at some point, it's good to check back in periodically to see if there are any changes in knowledge that would um, influence or change any recommendations or um, guidance that you've received in the past. And also there can be updates to testing. You know, in some cases, people have had testing quite some time ago or perhaps only in a research setting. And there may be some additional genetic testing that's worth considering. So I'll just leave you finally with kind of three key messages to take away is that, you know, inherited disease care really does work best when it's patient centered, but also when there's engagement of family members, because we can leverage all that information into the care of the patient that we have. And there's a lot to be gained from that. And, and, and acknowledging that both the patient and family members are all stakeholders in this process. And so second message, there is valuable information that can be attained from genetic testing for both you and your family. And third message that this really is best carried out by a team that has expertise given the complexities and nuances of genetic testing. So with that, I will end. Thank you very much. Thank you. We do have a question for you and it's, I'm gonna read it as written. And the question is, I'm 76. Uh, and this is an HCM patient. My adult son was genetically tested and got a negative result. So no need to repeat. I think we're missing a critical piece of information on this question. And that is 76 year old, were you tested and was a gene detected that was determined to be pathogenic? Is that what we should be asking her, Allison? Yeah, so I think, yeah, I think the question could be interpreted a couple of ways. Um, one, if the adult son also has HCM, I think we could interpret the question a little bit. If, if so, if the, so maybe I'll just answer it both ways, unless the question is, answered, is being answered in real time. <laughs> no, okay, so, okay, that's, so if, so if, if the adult son had HCM with a kind of, it has HCM and was recently genetic tested with a with a kind of comprehensive panel of the genes that we know can cause HCM and that testing was negative. I would say that there's no need to repeat genetic testing right now um, because there, you know, if, if the testing was done recently, there have not been very significant shifts in available genetic testing that would likely that are likely to change that result. Um, so the 76 year old reported back no testing she the 76 year old he she was not genetically tested right so if the so i think so if the 70s if somebody in the family with hcm had recent genetic testing and that was negative um we typically would not then move on to just test a different person in the family with with hcm so if the son has hcm and was negative I would say, and others can chime in if you feel differently, that the that the 76 year old would not then need to separately go through an HCM test. But of course, you know, we always, as I alluded to in the presentation, we also always want to make sure we're starting testing with the right person in the family. So if there's something more, um, you know, definitive or you know, con con convincing about our, this 76 year old HCM diagnosis, then we might want to consider whether or not we really did start the testing process with the right person. In which case, we may consider doing a more comprehensive genetic te HCM test in another family member. Okay, this other question came in before the session started and the person was unable to be here live but wanted to ask the question to watch it in the repeat later. Um, and the question is, how soon should you screen somebody in a family, a baby, a, a, a toddler, um, with a known mutation in the family? How soon is too soon? Where is the value to early genetic testing? So in that question, in that scenario, does, I'm sorry, does, does, there's a known variant in the family. There's a known variant a known in the family. Oh. There's a new baby born into the family. Yeah. When is the right time to screen newcomer? 
Yeah. So I, I think I think in my mind you kind of nails on the right the, the word with like what is the right time. I think for many, you know, th th there's going to be a different answer to what's the right time for different people. Um, there is certainly, you know, no no requirement or expectation that people are doing that type of predictive genetic testing in 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 you know babies, infants, and toddlers when there wouldn't you know if they're otherwise healthy without any you know symptoms or concerns about HCM because it wouldn't necessarily alter the care they're going to receive at that point. I think some people do start to think about it a little bit differently once the clinical screening recommendations kick in a little bit more and make decisions about whether or not that's information they would want to know as a parent for that child at that point. Um, but I think that is a pretty personal decision balanced against the fact that they're, you know, they're, you're testing a child before they have the ability to have any say in the testing process themselves. And they're, you know, they, given if we think about the paths and what would happen as the result of the testing, they would still be like being appropriately followed by getting, you know, uh, that periodic cardiac evaluation. So you're, um, you know, not missing out on appropriate care if you, you know, hold off on the decision to do a genetic test, if that seems to make most sense for the family and the and, and potentially to hold off for a child to have a um, more involvement in the decision about being tested. I see nodding heads, so we have a great- Oh yeah, others can chime in. Um, I don't, did anybody else wanna chime in on that one? Allison covered it, she nailed it. Okay, um, we're gonna get on to uh, Carolyn Ho's talk in a minute, but I wanna let you know who's here and what the poll responses were. So we have Northeast, Southeast, Western United States present tonight. No other countries. Darn, I was hoping for some others. Um, we have all patients tonight. So everybody here is a patient. 83% um, are on meds. 33% have ICDs. 50% have had previous septal uh, reduction therapy. 33% are in AFib. 33% of us have lost family members. 83% have had genetic testing. That's a pretty high number for a little group. And 83% uh, are currently considering a new medication or device. So we have a lot of people in fact-finding mode right now who are looking for some more information. So perfect timing for Carolyn Ho. Great, thanks so much, Lisa. It's really a pleasure to be um, with you and with the whole HCMA community tonight. So I couldn't resist. I know I was, uh, I was assigned to talk about cardiac myosin inhibitors, but I just wanted to also give a little bit of a bigger view and just talk um, about some of the new therapies uh, overall um, that have come um, into um, the sphere of HCM. It's really an exciting time to be in HCM. There are more choices and there's more activity and there's more uh, progress now than I think ever before. All right, so here's one schema about thinking about um, the landscape of HCM, the disease pathways, and what our current therapies are. So you can think about the fuse being lit um, when you inherit a sarcomeric variant. Um, and uh, as Allison um, and others have said, you don't. Um, you, uh, it's very unusual for people to be born with um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, disease typically doesn't develop until much later in life. You know, not until um, the late teenage years or the um, early adult years, or sometimes not even until middle age or beyond. But we have been able to see that there are some primary um, manifestations, some primary effects of having that sarcomere variant present. And um, we can see that uh, people tend to have have smaller LV cavities. Um, the, the heart tends to be super vigorous. Um, the, ten, the heart tends not to relax as well. And there's also a pro-fibrotic milieu, um, an environment where the heart wants to uh, make scar tissue. Um, and there are impaired um, energetics. There is a higher cost of, um, of energy expenditure in um, people's hearts when they just have the sarcomere variant, even if their LV wall thickness is normal, they don't have LVH, they don't have a clinical diagnosis of HCM. And then what's the influence of um, age, uh, genetic modifiers, which we haven't completely um, uh, identified yet, um, lifestyle and other uh, medical illnesses, clinically overt HCM can develop. And that's with the adverse remodeling that we see with um, left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, and that's when uh, the, you can have um, significant um, issues with outcomes and with symptoms. 
And so if there's an LV outside tract obstruction, then um, if there are symptoms related to it, we typically try beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, disapyramide, and invasive septal reduction therapies. That has been um, the, the therapeutic approach for many years um, with HCM. Um, if there are, are um, uh, ventricular arrhythmias, um, or if somebody has had a dangerous um, event, um, then they are given an ICD. And then in the others, our job is to work with you to try to figure out what your risk might be for having um, dangerous heart rhythm disturbances and figure out whether you might be somebody that would benefit from having a preventive ICD um, placed. We are always on the lookout for atrial fibrillation because uh, atrial fibrillation is really common in people that have HCM, particularly as uh, we get older and older for atrial fibrillation in HCM, it means after the ages of 30s or 40s, not in the 60s or 70s that we um, uh, see an increase in HCM in the general population. And we also know that there's a higher risk of having a stroke if you have HCM and atrial fibrillation. So we are on the lookout for it. Um, we give you a blood thinner and we try to control your heart rate and your rhythm to help you feel as well as possible. And then there are some unfortunate people that go on to have more advanced remodeling, more severe changes to the heart structure and function. That can be either um, a very stiff heart or a heart that um, starts to lose power, um, that, where the ejection fraction drops, and that occurs in maybe 8 um, to 10% of um, all individuals with HCM. And so that happens, um, then um, we uh, get you to see um, doctors like Neil or Garrick um, who specialize in heart failure and we uh, get you on uh, medication that we know that can help in those situations. And sometimes we have to even think about transplant, something that Lisa knows uh, very well. And so you can see that our current treatment really just targets symptoms and it can be effective for many, but not all patients. It starts relatively late in disease evolution and before the past couple of years, there hasn't been any disease specific or disease modifying therapies. And there's also been very sparse evidence regarding efficacy, very few clinical trials and almost no appropriately sized clinical trials have been done in HCM. So there was a lot of work uh, to be done. And really there's been, again, a, a remarkable amount of progress over the past handful of years. And so we've been able to take some of the insights we got from better understanding the biological, genetic, molecular underpinnings of HCM to really figure out how we might be able to um, improve your care. Um, as you've heard, HCM is a disease of the sarcomere. Um, Cricket and her husband, John Seidman, made this fundamental discovery back in the 1980s and 90s um, that the uh, disease causing changes in the genes that um, encode the sarcomere, the molecular motor of the heart, cause HCM. And the, um, if, when you look at all comers with HCM, um, about 30% of the time, you can find an underlying sarcomere variant as the cause. And if you take um, people with a family history of HCM and therefore a higher a priori likelihood of genetic disease, well over 60% of the time, we can find a sarcomere variant. That's the cause. And so using this, um, we've been able to actually create better, more, more specific uh, and more effective therapies. Um, so John and Cricket, as, as well as other scientific luminaries in the sarcomere field, um, Jim Spudish and Leslie Leinwand founded myocardia um, and really started to develop myosin and um, HCM specific therapies. And so doing that, you know, you know, let's think first about how the heart normally works. So normally, again, the sarcomere is a molecular motor of the heart. And the way that works is that the, the thick filaments um, of the heart it has there's has a is predominantly made up of a um, molecule called myosin. Myosin has a head on it that goes and grabs on to the thin filament, and when they attach, they ratchet against each other, and so the um, the sarcomere shortens, and that's what you have um, with contraction. And then at the end of contraction, the um, uh, myosin head lets go of the actin thin filament, the sarcomere lengthens again, and you have relaxation. So there's usually, in the normal situation, very highly regulated and orchestrated um, interaction between the actin uh, thin filament and the myosin thick filament that um, results in normal contractility and effective relaxation. Um, and so John and Cricket and um, uh, many other colleagues really helped to advance our understanding of HCM pathophysiology. Um, and one um, um, uh, really compelling model is that H and when you have HCM, you have too many actin myosin cross bridges engaged, too many hands pulling on the rope, too many um, oars in the water trying to row the boat. Um, and so that leads to the hypercontractility, 
the impaired relaxation and the altered myocardial energetics, the increased cost of energy expenditure that we see in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So there have been these new uh, medic medications called myosin inhibitors that have been um, developed. And the first in class uh, myosin inhibitor is a molecule called mavicamptin, which I'm sure that you've all heard of at this point. And so mavicamptin binds um, to a part of, of myosin to interfere with its ability to initially attach to actin. And so it reduces the number of actin myosin cross bridges that are there um, from the a, a, overabundance of them back to more towards a normal situation, and therefore it reduces the energy use, the ATP hydrolysis, and it decreases the excessive contractility and, and energy expenditure characteristic of HCM. So we have improvement in um, the uh, contractility is no longer so vigorous. We have improvement in the way the heart relaxes, and we have improvement in how much energy the heart needs to spend in order to beat. So the first um, agent, the mavicamptin, um, went through the uh, initial phase and then finally the pivotal uh, clinical trial is the Explorer trial. And so this um, slide uh, summarizes the results of the Explorer trial where there were 251 patients with symptomatic obstructive HCM that were randomized in one-to-one -to, -one to receive either mavicamptin or placebo and treated um, that way for 30 weeks. And um, um, because, you know, fortunately, um, um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is not a highly deadly disease. We're very um, happy about that. Um, so instead of looking to see whether this medication helps improve survival, um, um, look to see whether um, it improved the way people felt. Um, uh, because that's you know really one of the key things in ATM, how to get people to feel better, to be more active. And so the um, study was trying to assess whether people would do better on a uh, metabolic exercise test by increasing their peak VO2 or PVO2, or whether they would, they would feel better um, by having an improvement in their symptom burden as um, measured by this NYHA class, which is New York Heart Association class. And so you can see that Mavicamptin um, was able to better improve either or both um, exercise test performance and or um, NYHA symptoms than the placebo. Um, and there have been a number of uh, secondary findings which showed that it decreases um, uh, uh, blood markers of cardiac stress, NT pro BNP levels, and improves the way that people feel on another symptom score, this KCCQ score, and improves the relaxation of the heart as measured by E prime velocity. And it actually um, helps to decrease um, potentially how thick the heart might be. Um, and it decreases how big the um, left atrium is. It left the atri left atrium is often enlarged with HCM um, and that it seemed to get a little bit better um, after taking Mavicantin. And then there most recently has been a trial called Valor HCM. And this um, trial was meant to, to answer the question, um, does Mavicamptin, when you add it to your standard therapy, help people that are highly symptomatic with um, obstructive HCM and thinking about having invasive septal reduction therapy, does that addition of Mavicamptin allow them to either put off um, having um, invasive septal reduction therapy, that's either alcohol septal ablation or septal myectomy surgically, um, or does that um, uh, take away their their eligibility um, for having those um, procedures by um, either uh, making them feel so much better so you no longer have the symptoms that are required to uh, move forward um, with thinking about those procedures or reduce uh, remove the gradient that is a target of those procedures. And so in looking at people um, uh, given Mavicamptin for 16 weeks, um, uh, the trial was again positive and uh, showed that Mavicamptin provided adequate improvement for patients to defer um, moving forward with invasive septal reduction therapy. Um, so, um, and it seemed like mo most of the people in the trial were actually very keen to get Mavicamptin. Um, there were 16 weeks where you were again uh, randomized and blinded. So uh, there was a coin toss um, um, and you were e either given Mavicamptin or you were given placebo, but you knew that in 16 weeks, you could um, switch over and, and get a um, Mavicamptin even if you started off with placebo. So um, only two people from each group decided to move forward with um, invasive septal reduction therapy in that 16 week time period. And um, almost everybody decided they, they wanted to get a Mavicamptin to try after that. 
And so um, as we talked about, the main way that mavicantin works is that it makes the heart beat less forcefully. So we know that's gonna um, uh, decrease your left ventricular ejection fraction, the measure of how forcefully your heart is beating. Um, and so that's um, why we have to be so careful with, uh, with mavicantin because if, if you take too much, um, you can re reduce your ejection fraction um, quite a bit. Um, but luckily um, in the doses needed um, to uh, improve people with HCM, there's just a, a very modest um, decrease in the left ventricular ejection fraction. If you started off with an EF of 74%, um, you ended up with an EF of 70%. That's not a change that anybody's going to notice. Um, but with that, um, there was a very substantial decrease in your left ventricular outflow tract gradient, um, with the gradients dropping over 50 millimeters of mercury. And that's you know, astoundingly more than we've ever seen with beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, or even with disapyramide, where the gradient reduction is really pretty um, is really quite small, sometimes not even detectable. And it's almost at the level that we see with these um, invasive procedures. Well, one thing to keep in mind is that some people, um, about 3% in the various trials, have had a more dramatic, also reversible decrease in the LVEF, where the um, ejection fraction fell below 50%, and they had to either take a break or decrease their dose of Mavicampton. The EF did recover um, after that, but it's something that um, that we um, have to be uh, uh, quite cognizant about. And so that's why it's not so easy um, to get Mavicampton. Um, so Mavicampton was FDA approved in April um, and uh, in, you know, in recognition of um, the relative lack of experience with uh, Mavicampton, only a few hundred people have used it for a few years. Um, so we're, we're still getting um, experience with how to use Mavicampton um, and um, knowing that it can have this um, important um, consequence of dropping your EF too far. Um, the FDA has um, required this REMS program. Well, that REMS stands for Risk Evaluation Mitigation Strategy. Um, and it makes it so that we can't just you know, call in a prescription um, for Mavicampton and you pick it up at CVS at your convenience. Um, you and your healthcare provider must be enrolled in the uh, REMS program. So Camzios is the uh, trade name of Mavicampton. It's what um, Bristol Myers Squibb has, has uh, called Mavicampton as their, uh, their, uh, uh, um, as their trade name. And you can only get CAMSIOS from a certified pharmacy, which is also uh, participating in the REMS program. Um, so again, um, the, um, our uh, specialty pharmacy at the Brigham is a certified pharmacy. So they're happy to get um, medications for you and they're um, happy to go through the uh, fairly uh, uh, rigorous um, process of um, getting prior authorization because um, it's a new medication. New medications are often extremely expensive. I think that the list price of Mavicampton for a year worth of therapy is like $89,000. So certainly that's not something that anybody's going to be able to afford. Um, but there, are, um, it's often um, very well covered um, if you have commercial insurance um, with the copays usually of $10 to $20 uh, a month in that scenario. Um, we're um, Medicare uh, patients have more difficulty. It really depends on the specifics of your Part D coverage. Um, and again, our pharmacy can help um, work with you to try to figure out exactly what your out-of-pocket costs will be. Um, and there are also drug and, um, and non-drug um, interactions with CAMSIOS because of the way that it's metabolized by your body. So we had to make sure that you're not on um, uh, 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 medications um, that might um, increase or decrease the level, um, or you're not um, using other things like grapefruit juice um, uh, can sometimes interfere. Um, and um, being on um, Mavicampton, you know, also requires um, a lot of monitoring at this point. Again, uh, because uh, you know the, the Mav uh, Mavicampton appear to be quite safe in the clinical trials, but you know, in recognition of the fact that it's a new medicine, and again, um, we don't have a lot of experience, um, the FDA is requiring very vigilant monitoring. So you will need to have an e um, echo at the beginning, right before you start taking treatments, at four weeks, eight weeks and 12 weeks after treatment is started and every 12 weeks thereafter. Um, so you, people are usually started on a dose of five milligrams a day. Um, we're not allowed to increase your dose until after that 12 week mark, just to make sure that everything's settling and okay. If your EF um, drops at all, um, uh, you know, um, then we um, dial back the Mavicampton to a lower dose and reassess. All right, and then Mavicampton isn't the only um, uh, 
agent in development. Afficampton is a new kid on the block. It's the myosin inhibitor um, that is um, um, uh, developed by Cytokinetics. Um, it is finishing up the Redwood um, phase two trials um, and is um, now starting um, their phase three trial, um, the Sequoia trial, which will um, hopefully allow them also to apply for FDA approval. So where do myosin inhibitors currently fit into practice? Well, right now they're really for people with symptomatic obstructive HCM. So if you have limiting symptoms from your HCM, you have obstruction, and we're pretty sure that the obstruction is the cause of your symptoms, then this is um, uh, where Mavicampton offers um, uh, a new option. And we can think about using it in three different ways. We can use it in an exploratory way and see, you know, does improving your obstruction actually help you feel better. Um, there are some people that have a lot of other things that may be contributing to why um, uh, you're not able to be as active as you would like to be. Um, you could have lung disease, you could um, um, have uh, musculoskeletal disease, you could be very deconditioned because of being ill from other reasons. Um, you um, could have um, uh, problems with um, uh, being overweight and having um, a lot of uh, potential symptoms for that, or the whole mixture can um, can sometimes make it very difficult to say what's actually driving the symptoms. So Mavic Hampton um, can help us say, okay, if we treat the obstruction effectively, how do you feel? Um, you can think about for long-term therapy, if it's um, if the obstruction really is um, driving the symptoms and you could just take Mavic Hampton and potentially stay on it um, uh, relatively indefinitely um, if it makes you feel better and drops your gradient. Um, and it's a, it can also be used as a bridge to decide whether you want invasive septal reduction therapy. You know, it's a big commitment to say you're going to have um, heart surgery or even um, alcohol septal ablation. Um, you know, sometimes it might be nice to just take things out for a test drive a little bit. And, say, and again, say, if, you know, I can reduce my obstruction, how much better do I feel? Am I okay still taking this pill? Um, and, you know, for the short term, at least having to uh, come in for all these um, monitoring visits, or, you know, do I feel like I want to move on with septal reduction therapy? So, you know, the, the bottom line is it's really great to have more choices and Mavicampton is, is providing a really great new choice of effective medical therapy for obstructive HCM. And so remaining questions are, you know, will myosin inhibitors work for non-obstructive HCM or even heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? Um, if you are severely symptomatic and have non-obstructive HCM, that's really a huge clinical challenge because we don't have effective therapies and we are um, sorely needing them. Um, and uh, Mavicampton and Afficampton are currently um, actively being tested to see whether they might help. There's a little bit of um, data that suggested that Mavicampton uh, may be beneficial and that's being ramped up into a, a larger scale trial. Um, we need, again, to learn more about the long-term safety and efficacy. Our total human experience with Mavicampton uh, is, again, about 400 people that have taken it, you know, um, you know most for not even a year yet. So, um, you know, hence the REMS program, um, you know, making sure that we are providing um, Mavicampton in a safe and monitored way. Um, and then we also want to know, is there a role for disease modification, um, giving Mavicampton very early, even before you have clinically overt HCM, can it help to um, reduce um, the progression to disease? There's interesting and really exciting um, results from a mouse um, study where it looked like it really um, had some benefit in attenuating and delaying disease um, development. I think we'll need to know a lot more um, about the, the safety um, of Mavicampton before we think about starting to use it in this um, realm. You know, we want to make sure that it's really safe and well tolerated and, and people with symptoms that we're treating before we roll back um, the clock and use it in healthy young people. Um, and then just to, to finish up, um, there are other ways that we can think about going about disease modification. Um, and so this is from a mouse study that was done in John and Cricket Seidman's lab um, a number of years ago now, um, where um, based on uh, some understanding about the pathways that lead into the development of HCM. Um, there was a thought that blocking TGF beta, this master molecule um, um, that um, drives scar tissue formation. So blocking TGF beta with either an antibody directed against it or with um, losartan, um, which is a commonly used blood pressure medicine, um, uh, was able to help um, decrease the development of HCM in mice if they were given it early in life um, before LVH developed. And you can see that the, there's less blue, which represents fibrosis in the mice that were treated, and the hearts are also um, a bit less thick. And so um, 
We um, therefore launched the VANISH trial, which Neil talked about. Um, this was a novel strategy of disease modification in sarcomeric HCM to see if we could target early stage disease, which is potentially more responsive to being intervened upon with a medicine. So it, it's very hard to reverse um, disease once it's really severely entrenched, but it might be easier biologically to, you know, to stop it from ramping up so quickly. So starting early could have some advantage biologically. Um, so we um, tested whether Valsartan could do this um, and looked at a, an um, outcome that looked at a number of different metrics that looked at the, the function and structure of the heart. Um, and we found that treatment was best in uh, people that had um, the smallest um, amount, amount of hypertrophy in the, in the beginning. And that, you know, again, um, reinforces the fact that disease modifying therapy may be most effective if we give it early in disease. Um, and um, this uh, successful trial um, implies that there's an opportunity to attenuate or decrease disease progression in people with sarcomeric HCM with a widely available and well-tolerated medication. So looking forward to the future, um, we can now have, add myosin inhibitors to our armamentarium of, of treating people with symptomatic obstructive HCM. Um, might there be a role um, in using it in the preclinical stage? You know, I think that remains to be uh, seen, but that would be very exciting to think about um, testing once we're again confident about the safety. And then we can also think about um, using angiotensin receptor blockers like Valsartan um, based on the results of the Viennis trial in early disease. Um, and it's a way to, um, to, you know, for us to partner together and uh, make a decision that feels right to you. Some people really like the idea of being proactive and saying, you know, this is a very safe um, uh, uh, medication. You could take it forever. Um, you know, there's no um, real uh, long-term toxicity associated with it. It might be beneficial. We can't tell from the Vanish trial if it will make you live longer or if it will make it less likely that you will develop um, severe consequences of HCM. It looked like it made the heart, um, uh, uh, Function better and um, and change less, um, but I you know we don't know if it will make you actually feel better, live longer. Um, but some people say um, there's little downside. I'm up for being proactive. I'd like to take it um, to to try to see if we can do that. And then other people say you know. Um, you know, unless you can really tell me it's going to make a huge difference, I'd rather not take a medication. And I think that either one of those uh, uh, thoughts about um, Valsartan um, are, are very um, valid and appropriate. It's just a matter of trying to figure out which uh, might um, suit your own personal philosophy best. And so a dis uh, discussion that we'd be delighted to have with you. So um, that's it for me. And thank you so much for your attention. And I'll be very happy to answer any questions and then turn on to Cricket. Well, Neil's clearing out my question and answer queue here, but I am going to take a moment to review one of the questions that he answered, um, just so those who are watching um, after the broadcast can actually get the answers too. Um, so the question was, are there trials for non-obstructed HCM? I think we covered that towards the end of the talk. Um, there are a couple of other trials you can find out about uh, at 4HCM.org, and you can use the clinical trial finder on our page to identify clinical trial opportunities for you, whether you're obstructed or non-obstructed, you can make those choices. Um, but there are some options there. So that's that's great to know that we have options. Um, the toolbox is getting more and more full. Uh, picking the right tools out of the toolbox takes a little bit more expertise as we get deeper in. And that's why these programs are so important. Um, so we have we do have a question, CAMS IOS related. Um, I don't think we've had a big hearted warrior tour this year without CAMS IOS questions. I had a cephalomyectomy in 2015. Am I eligible to try CAMS IOS? I'm still having shortness of breath. I've had an ICD since 2012 and I'm 60 pounds overweight. Thank you for your uh, uh, being honest on that one. No, people don't typically do that. Um, what do you think? Is a post myectomy HCM who's symptomatic going to be a candidate for CAMS IOS? Um, yes, um, you know, you're, you're uh, you know, certainly something that could be tried. And again, you know, it's one of these situations that we want to see, you know, did the myectomy do as much as we um, hoped it would in terms of reducing obstruction? Sometimes, um, you know, despite best efforts, the obstruction um, isn't uh, uh, improved as much as we would like. Um, so if there's residual obstruction, then I think that would be a great um, uh, 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 time to try um, to try Mavicampton to see if more effective gradient reduction can help you feel better. 
I'm going to jump on to his question just to get it out there, and I'd love to hear all of your comments on this. How aggressive should somebody with HCM be about weight reduction? Yeah. I mean, it's always good to be as close to your um, you know, optimal weight as, as possible, just in terms of your overall well-being, um, health, and, and uh, future. It's, um, you know, it's one of the great... Uh, best things that you can do proactively for your health, but you know, it's much easier said than done. Um, and it's also much easier said than done when you're feeling lousy and you're having a hard time exercising. Exactly. Um, are you guys, <clears throat> excuse me, are you um, advocating for gastric sleeve, uh, medications yeah. for weight loss? Do you have a strategy that you tend yeah. to follow? Yeah, all of the above. I think that we um, recommend you know, a structured weight loss program, either an app-based program. There are a bunch of different apps that um, people can try, both um, free and um, subscription-based. Um, um, there are formal programs like Weight Watchers or WW or what, whatever we're calling them now. Whatever Oprah's um, calling it today. Whatever. <laughs> um, you know, be, you know having some structure does not, you know, because it's very hard to lose weight and say, I'm just going to eat less. Because, you know, like, what does that mean? Um, you know, so something to just, you know, try to like, um, you know, keep you, um, you know, uh, more organized about that, I think can be incredibly helpful. Um, there are a number of different medications that um, we can think about using, and we've worked um, uh, closely with um, our weight management program, including our bariatric surgery. So, you know, nothing's off the table. Um, and, you know, I would say that even somebody with, um, you know, fairly, you know, limiting symptoms and symptomatic obstruction, um, you know, we've um, successfully, you know, got people safely through um, bariatric surgery. Neil, could you comment on that with regard to the transplant pathway patients as well? Yeah, I mean, super relevant, um, especially when it comes to transplant. Most programs will use a body mass index of 35 as a threshold, um, above which patients may not be transplant eligible. There is a little bit of difference from program to program and region to region. Um, and I think we all acknowledge the body mass index is an imperfect measure of obesity, but it is what's used frequently. Um, it's a major consideration um, and something that now, you know, we talk about the toolbox for HCM, there's a much bigger toolbox for the management of obesity. Um, I think as cardiac providers, we really try not to imp impose a judgmental approach to this, but rather to appreciate that um, uh, it's a medical disease for which there are effective therapies, not at all to downplay the role of diet and exercise. So there's a class of medicines initially developed for diabetes called GLP-1 agonists, which are um, increasingly shown to be effective for weight loss in people with diabetes in particular, but uh, may actually benefit people even without diabetes. Um, importantly for what we do, they're, they're safe for the heart. Many prior therapies for weight loss, um, medical therapies for weight loss actually were associated with um, an increased risk of heart disease, which was sort of perverse. And, and you know, beyond people who need transplants, I think the other point I'd make is uh, another reason to lose weight is sometimes we see an improvement in obstruction. There does appear to be a relationship between obstruction and the severity of obesity. And without question, you're gonna reduce your risk of incident atrial fibrillation. And uh, AFib is the most common heart rhythm problem for people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So even if, even if it's hard and, and, and we would want to partner with you, it's worth um, uh, working towards. Yeah, no, yeah, I'd also add um, obstructive sleep apnea to that, which we know, you know it's, um, it's a huge problem for you know, everybody and particularly people with HCM. Absolutely. Um, that's a good talk for another big heart. We might come back to that one. Um, related to CAMS IOs, again, um, I have seen some behind the scenes data. I haven't seen anything pushed forward on this yet. Paxlovid and CAMSIOS. So the, the treatment for COVID mm -hmm. is, is a no-go, but it didn't quite get on the front page of the no-go list. Um, can we talk about why Paxlovid, if you have COVID, is not an option if you're taking CAMSIOS? Yeah, I, I think so. The one thing we've learned about CAMSIOS um, at Campton is that um, uh, we have to be very respectful of the dosing of that medication and the, um, the drug concentration um, may increase when a, another drug is given that interferes with the metabolism of CAMSIOS. And if that drug concentration increases, we may 
overshoot the mark and see a reduction in ejection fraction. And we, we know there's actually a strong um, effect of Paxlovid on the enzymes the body uses to break down CAMZIOS. And so uh, if for our patients who are receiving CAMZIOS and then patients who are in the Mavicampton studies who we continue to follow, um, we, we strongly advise them you, just in routine visits that if you if you get COVID, we need to hear about it, but do not take this medication, Paxlovid, um, given the interaction. And the interactions with Paxlovid are broad, very, very broad. Very broad. So no one should take Paxlovid mm -hmm. who is on any medication without talking with their healthcare provider. Um, and I think especially with the evidence that rebound infection happens after Paxlovid makes this the, be very important for everyone to consider a discussion with their physician before they take it. So... Understood, Paxlovid, Camzios, bad. Any problem with ramdesivir or any of the other monoclonal antibodies, any other treatments for COVID should, we're going back into probably a peak again. Hopefully more people are vaccinated. And if you could all say a comment about what you feel about vaccination for COVID and flu, I'd appreciate that too. Vaccination for COVID and flu should happen to everyone in America and around the world, including people with HCM. It's safe, it's preventative of serious infections, and it also limits your ability to give it to someone who might have an even worse reaction to disease than you. I try to get everybody to repeat that, hoping that the universe will hear it and take okay. action accordingly. Okay, thank you for that. Without yeah, further ado. Yeah, and just one more plug for that. You know, the, the, the new um, vaccine, vaccines, of bi, they're called bivalent because they hit two different strains um, and they're the relevant strains. There's been very little uptake on them. And, you know, there's a, um, you know, I think that there's booster fatigue um, for sure. Um, but here's a really good reason to get a booster because these actually are different and more effective. Um, and you can get them simultaneously with your flu vaccine. I have both of them. I'm leaving the country in a couple of days, wanted to be fully vaccinated. I did mine 10 days apart because I do get a little bit of an effect, but I, it's good. I'm fine. Tired for a day on each of them, but we're good. We're okay. And we're protected. I have to protect Brandy's heart. You know, it's used goods, hand-me-downs. I like this. Okay. Um, without further ado, um, I'm going to go back here uh, in time a little bit because I think it's important. And full disclosure, um, I used to stalk somebody at conferences and said, did you find my gene yet? Did you find my gene yet? Every time I would see somebody. And one day I got a phone call and uh, the answer was, yes, Lisa, we found the gene that runs in your family. It is myosin binding protein C. And that allowed us to learn a lot more about our family and um, understand who was at risk and who was not at risk. We were confused. We had wrong information. Um, but it helped us uh, understand our family a little bit better and take a little bit more control over decisions that we were making for family members and kids. So that person on the phone was Dr. Christine Seidman, aka Cricket, and um, I'm happy to invite her to Tales from the Heart to tell us a little bit more about what's going on and some research updates. Cricket, I'll tell you. Lisa, thank you very much. And I remember that conversation very well, as I'm sure you do as well. I do. Um, I, I am delighted to be here um, and would look forward to telling you lots of excitement of what is going on. But I also want to take a moment and thank everyone um, in the virtual space out there, in particular, my um, amazing colleagues who you've heard from today, uh, the Cardiovascular Genetic Center has been the focus of my life for 30 years. Um, and we have, um, with the whole scientific and clinical community around the world, I think made amazing accomplishments that everyone, um, both patients, providers, and family members have really helped to accomplish. Um, we have great understandings of the pathophysiology of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We know the genetic etiology, as Carolyn told you, in a large number of individuals, and there are more genetic etiologies that are being discovered every day. They have not stopped. They will continue. We will know more in the years to come. 
But even with them already, we've been able to build important models and to understand them deeply, initially working with small little rodents, and certainly more recently, directly with human tissues from patients who have had biopsies or who have had explants, um, and by the generation of human-induced pluripotential stem cells. And while all of these things have taught us a whole lot, I want to summarize that they're not basic science uh, discoveries only. These have very, very specifically led to important therapies that are making people save, uh, feel better and hopefully extending their long-term good health. You heard today from Carolyn Ho's very elegant talk about interventions that try and reduce the fibrotic load, which we know is one of the drivers of hypertrophy. It is one of the drivers of also atrial fibrillation and importantly of other serious arrhythmias. We know about biomechanical efforts, both um, from CAMZIOS and from the newer molecules coming down the street that all are trying to address based on our understandings of the pathophysiology of the disease at the level of the cardiomyocyte uh, directly. But what I wanna turn your attention to today is something that this whole community has recognized for a long time. And that's that for many, many patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it's a genetic disorder. And many of our patients have said to us, if you know that this is what causes my condition, why don't you just fix that which is broken? So today, what I'd like to give you is a bit of a glimpse into the future in terms of how we are very, very seriously thinking about this. And I'm going to start with a quote from Carolyn, actually, which she gave to me many years ago and continues to be my absolute favorite. The ultimate opportunity presented by discovering the genetic basis for human disease is the accurate prediction and prevention of the disease development. And so for several years now, we've been trying to understand, are there ways to actually treat the genetic basis for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? And with a group of international scientists, including all of the people you've heard from today, we are going to tackle this very direct and truly curative approach to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I'm very lucky in being also able to tell you that we're gonna do this with the support of the British Heart Foundation, who is so invested in getting this solved that they had a grand challenge and awarded this opportunity to us to take it forward. So what are we going to do? Well, we know that when we understand a genetic cause of disease, especially of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, that there are certain uh, outcomes that appear to be universally true. The first is that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a dominant mutation. That means that of the two genes that encode all the proteins that can be altered in the disease, only one of them is abnormal the other one's perfectly fine. The one that is abnormal can also have two different outcomes arise from a change in the DNA of the, that particular gene. It can either become dominant negative, and the prototypic example of that are the myosin missense mutation. These myosin molecules are made at the same number as the normal myosins within each heart cells. So the protein level is normal, but the function is perturbed because no protein works all by itself. It interacts with other proteins and this abnormality can poison, if you will, the whole complex of protein-protein interactions. The other thing that can happen is a mutation can result in abnormal signals that do not allow the protein to be made in the full amount. We call that haploinsufficiency. Haplo meaning half, because again, you have one normal gene that makes one normal amount of protein, but the mutated gene doesn't usually make any. And in that instance, myosin binding protein C is the prototypic example. And here, if we wanted to think about directly treating these two different genetic consequences, we would need different approaches. For those mutations that reduce the protein level, what we want to do is supplement the gene so that there's the normal amount of protein in the cell. 
By contrast, if the mutation results in a poisoning of a protein complex, we want to either fix that poison, take it away and make it work normally, or else make it silent so it can do no harm. So how are we gonna tackle that truly in my lifetime? And the answer is, it's a work in progress, but we are making considerable progress. I want to tell you about what we know the least first, and then I'll tell you a little bit of good news. So for those genes such as myosin binding protein C, where we don't make enough protein when there is a hypertrophic mutation, it would be great to just make that protein and stick it into a, a syringe and give it to patients and see if it would go to the right place. The problem is, even if that was feasible in terms of getting that protein into the heart, these molecules are simply too big to deliver. There is no vehicle known at present that can deliver a full myosin binding protein C protein. And so we've taken another step back and we've gone back to what I told you initially. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients have one normal healthy gene. So instead, what we are doing is looking at the molecular medicine, the molecular signals rather, that regulate how much protein each gene copy makes. And in so doing, what we've done is to understand the sequences that are critical for regulating, should I make one level or a little bit more or a little bit less? When we understand those signals, what we can then do is go in and juice them up a little bit, activate the signals so that they make a little more than they would if they just had the normal signals. But we need to very precisely target exactly the right signal in doing so. The other thing we've learned in a lot of molecular biology is that there are other signals around genes that actually repress the amount of protein that is made by that gene. And so obviously, if one of those signals sat in front of the normal, healthy myosin binding protein C gene, we'd like to knock that signal out to release the break and allow more normal protein to be made. Now, these are basic fundamental experiments that are ongoing in the laboratory every day, but I think you can look forward to hearing about them more in the future. I wanna turn my attention now to something where we have some more immediate solutions. And those are those mutations that are dominant negative or the ones that poison a particular protein. And again, the representative gene that causes this in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the myosin gene that you've heard so much about today. We know that these mutations basically result in a spelling error in making the myosin protein. And shown here is a sequence of protein components, amino acids, that should be proline, arginine, valine, lysine, et cetera. And those are made from the normal gene copy in all human beings. As it turns out, a hypertrophic patient has a different change in the spelling, and one of those changes, instead of having proline arginine, will have a proline glutamine. Now, that's a very subtle change that causes all of the downstream consequences of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. How could we possibly go in and fix that very nucleotide? Well, enter the hero of our story. There have been chemists who have been actively working on how the nucleotide sequences that encode amino acids work and can be manipulated. And some of the newest and most exciting opportunities have come from those who have learned to use what are called base editors to use an enzyme that can be directly targeted to a specific nucleotide and change that nucleotide into a different one. In the olden days, when we used to type on a, an electric or a manual computer, you'd take white out and you'd white out with a little gooey substance to get rid of the wrong spelling. And then you'd go back and type over it. And that's essentially what these um, editors are doing as well. They are not cutting DNA. They are not 
tweaking all sorts of things. They're simply taking through a series of biochemical uh, reactions and changing the letter A to a letter G, or this particular one can turn a T into a C. Well, if you look here now, I hope you can appreciate that the normal letter should be a G, but if you change it to an A, you have a spelling error and an, an amino acid change that causes hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This adenine base editor could change that A back to a G. So what happens when we use it? Well, we've taken that and introduced first and foremost cells that carry the mutant mutation in one gene copy and made them into induced potential pluripotent stem cells. And these then can be differentiated into cardiomyocytes. And because we put a little green tag on them, they will show up as green and beating in the dish of a culture dish. When we take them then and measure those cells in the dish, we see that normal healthy cells from an individual without a mutation have contractility in this instance that we measure at about 12%. If you carry the mutation, the 403 mutation that causes hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you get hypercontractility, hyperdynamic contraction, just like we see in our human patients. But if we apply base editors to these cells in a dish, you can see here that we restored normal contractility back to the absolutely appropriate letter. And the reason for that is when we take these cells out of the dish and sequence them, we recognize that we have corrected over 90% of the spelling errors with a base editor. And now the only sequence in these cells is the proline and arginine, valine, et cetera. Well, that's very easy to do in a dish, quite frankly, and it's a lot harder to do that in a living organism. But we wanted to push this further, and so we've gone on now to take a mouse that carries, again, the same mutation at residue 403 of myosin in one of the gene copies. We call this mouse the 403 mouse. And when we administer with a single dose these editors, we find that we can train them to go exactly where we want them to go, and they also will correct in vivo the same kind of G, sorry, A residue turning back into G that we saw in the dish. In fact, when we take the cells out of the heart and again sequence them, we have corrected over about 80% of the cells within the heart. Moreover, when we follow these mice over time, we no longer see the development of hypertrophy as the mice that are not treated continue to develop. We have no cardiac fibrosis and the animals are perfectly, perfectly healthy. They have normal vitality and they are indistinguishable from their wild type litter mates. Well, how can we do that for hundreds and hundreds of different mutations? That would be a huge challenge. And it's actually possible that this technology will improve rapidly enough that that may someday be feasible because it would allow a treatment to be given and to have that treatment be curative. So what we call a one and done treatment so that the individual could then go forward without further concern of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But even before then, we can do something else. If everybody that we sequence has a different mutation and we can't correct each and every one, perhaps we could silence the gene from making a bad protein if, in fact, you only need half the amount of protein to be fine. And as it turns out, that's true of myosin. There are some people who have only one functional myosin gene copy, and they're perfectly, perfectly well. Indeed, in a mouse, if we take out one of their gene copies, the mouse has no idea that it is only working with one myosin protein. That's very different from C protein, but it's true for myosin. And so what we've tried to do is say, well, what happens if we not edit the actual um, mutation away and correct it? What if we just silence that one gene copy? And showing you here is what we see when we do that. 
On the left-hand side is a mouse heart. Carolyn showed you one before with lots of fibrosis in it. Again, this mouse is untreated. If we silence it in this instance is using RNAi, we have no fibrosis. The architecture of the heart is perfect and there is no development hypertrophy. Moreover, we've recognized that in doing this over and over again, we don't need to treat all of the cells of the heart. If we get somewhere around 75% of them being corrected, we do very, very well, and the animals appear to be quite well. Finally, and perhaps you may be wondering, how do we actually deliver this stuff to the right place? It's actually turned out to require the skill sets of vectorologists, if you will. And these scientists have made what can be considered a molecular envelope into which we can take our powerful base editing tools and we can put around those molecular envelopes a zip code that says go to the heart and only go into and open the envelope in a cardiomyocyte. And I'm showing you that here pictorially in which we introduced a green protein into that molecular envelope. We gave it to a mouse and then, frankly, we looked at all the organs in the mouse. And I think you can appreciate we have lots and lots of green protein in this mouse heart. And we have absolutely none in the liver, nor in any of the other tissues that we've looked at. So we've come a really, really long way in understanding how we could actually cure mutations that cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, in particular as a first step those that are missense mutations. We aim to do this and extend it beyond those, as I've told you, to even those that have haploinsufficiency. Our goal is again to either correct the mutant gene or to silence it when that's an appropriate option, or if we can't silence it, to upregulate the endogenous gene. Moreover, we plan to only fix the heart these therapies will not be going to the germ cells that go into making ovaries and sperm. So that will not be a treatment that prevents disease from developing in future generations. It will only be treating the heart. That's important because the heart is an enormously stable organ and tissue. The cells are not rapidly dividing. That's why heart disease is so devastating. And we know that they have a very low likelihood of ever developing cancers. It's extraordinarily rare to have a cancer from the heart. And so the likelihood that these events, an off-target or unintended event could cause a, a cardiac tumor are exceedingly, exceedingly low. But even beyond that opportunity, we know that we need to balance the risk and the potential benefit. This isn't the therapy for every single person with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But unfortunately, all of us know there are many patients who, despite all of the therapies you've heard about today, may still need more aggressive treatment. So we aim to continue our research to know what is the right patient in whom to target these treatments and what is the right time in those patients. But ultimately, I hope I've shown you there's incredible new scientific progress that will allow us to cure genetic heart diseases and to prevent those disease from ever arising in individuals who have these treatments early. Finally, I hope that throughout this evening, you've come to recognize the amazing opportunities of coming to a place like Brigham and Women's Cardiovascular Genetic Center. Our colleagues here have incredible amounts of expertise in delivering absolutely state-of-the-art care and compassion in the treatment and management of their patients and family members. Moreover, the opportunities to participate in research and to benefit from that research, I think, has really changed how we understand and can treat and take care of patients today to make their lives healthier, which is our ultimate goal in all that we do. So I'm gonna stop there and see if there are any questions. There are questions. 
and there are wow like everybody really just needs to stop here for just a second and appreciate what that just was when 15 20 years ago we said well gene editing or gene therapy or alteration of the gene conceptually yes so far off in the future no it's it's here and it's amazing and we have this opportunity that no generation before us has ever had we have we have amazing amounts of hope and promise here and I don't use words like that. I've been doing this for 26 years. I don't use the C word, but I think we can start to hope for the C word for some. We still need to understand all the different genes. Oh, yeah. We still have work to do. We are nowhere at the finish line yet, but cricket, wow. What do you forget about like all the science stuff? What do you feel about this right now? I'm going off script here. <laughs> like, what do you feel about these changes? Because this is this is big. Of course, Lisa, it's very big, and we're very we're very pleased and excited to be able to share it with you. Um, Lisa founded the HCMA many many years ago. Um, we started the Cardiovascular Genetic Center even before then, in 1991. And it's through the WEF efforts of all of the patients who contributed so much that we've gotten to where we are. And that's the reason why these HCM Centers of Excellence matter, because we can change the future. Not me, not you, but we. This we is a collective effort, and it's going to take a collective bit more work, um, but we're much closer than we've ever been before. You're right. And thank you for your high praise. I appreciate it. it it's it, it's well-deserved. Um, it's it's really an extraordinary time. You know, myosin inhibitors, yay, awesome. You know, other therapeutics that are being or developed, Imbria's got a drug they're de developing. Uh, so uh, Celtrion is working on a, an alternative to like NorPCR. We have more alternatives but they aren't root cause. And if we can alter root cause, then game changer. And I think we're much closer than I ever thought we would be at this point. A year and a half ago, when I was watching discoveries pop up, I'm like, wow, I, I'm go I live to see this. I didn't think I'd live to see it. My heart didn't live to see it, but I did. So it's all good. So I, I will stop my, my, uh, my, my uh, gushing at the moment uh, and answer some questions. My son has HCM due to myosin heavy chain. Um, he is so far very mildly affected. Would he be a candidate for gene therapy or would it be used primarily for people with severe disease? Well, those are obviously very important questions and I'm glad your son is only mildly affected and I hope he continues that way. Um, we are not ready to deliver this to anybody today. Um, this is still at the preclinical stage. Um, to give you a timeline, what happens when you have things that show promise is the first thing you do is move them to a larger animal. And in this regard, we have the opportunity to take these primary discoveries to move them into pigs. Believe it or not, there are hypertrophic cardiomyopathy pigs with human mutations in them. Um, there then can be opportunities to move forward towards non-human primates to look for safety and then to actually have an investigational drug application to the FDA. That's not happening this year or next. So we have years to go forward, but I am very hopeful that we will move in that pathway expeditiously. That's our goal. That's our plan. And with everyone on the line, and the Zoom, we're going to get it done. So and I want to just go back and timeline this just a little bit and give it some context. On a street corner in Boston, and I think it was 2013 or 14, you said, 
there's this new thing coming. There's going to be this new company, myocardia, myosin inhibitors, myosin. I don't think we used the word myosin inhibitor then. But from that conversation to the drug being approved by the FDA, we were at about eight years. Yeah, a little less that, than that. Myocardia little, founded it was six years um, to the FDA, six, seven years. It, it's fast. It, 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 it was fast. Yeah. Are we on that kind of a timeline with genetics or is it a slower role? Um, certainly the field of gene therapy is moving so fast that I think we could be on that timeline. The regulators, and this is very important, need to be convinced of safety and efficacy. And it's going to be a change in the way they view things because safety is easy in some regard to measure. Efficacy means you don't get sick or you don't get sicker. So the stability or the lack of you know, diminished health is a hard thing to monitor. So there's going to need to be some new strategies to ascertain efficacy. Um, and that's going to take some education by the FDA um, for my clinical colleagues and my brilliant biomarker colleagues to help us figure out how we develop those important um, goals that show that we're doing something good. Ultimately, when this goes into humans, initially it will go to people who are very severely affected and probably undergoing transplant so that we could simply monitor by looking at heart cells because we can't take them out of people who are healthy, um, but have we corrected the mutation in those heart cells? I'm sorry I transplanted five years ago or I would have given you mine, but I can't go back and do that. Um, I think those are really great points. I, I also think that there is an amazing role here for patient advocacy and potentially even something else like the PFDD that we did for drug development. I think we need to focus on educating the FDA on what the patient community is willing to deal with and what risks we're willing to take to see these therapies get developed. And they 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 listen very well to our, our PFDD and the patient saying, we'll do a REMS, we'll do all these safety things for you. We want the drug to market. So I think the patient voice is gonna be very important here and we need to collaborate and make sure that we get the right message to the right people at the right time before they get, get afraid of things that they don't understand fully. Question from the audience. So if you do not have a genetic mutation that has been found, do you still have these sarcomere anomalies? So um, in terms of genetics, no, you do not. Um, and you can't do gene therapy. You can't fix what's not broken, if you will. Um, but that is because we recognize um, that what we can address from this kind of genetic therapy is a very profound impact from one gene. Moving forward, it's been recognized that there are lots of more subtle changes in many genes that collectively could contribute and cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And that probably accounts for a substantial amount of people who are mutation negative. They have variants in many genes and it's a collection of them that happen to be inherited from mom and dad. And the mixture results in a phenotype, a disease we call hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. If you fast forward in the very distant future, if we can fix one, maybe we can fix several of the key ones that could contribute to multi-genetic causes. That's a long way in the distance. Future. Strictly hypothesis here. If one of those mutations seems to be the driver for the rest, if you corrected one, would that potentially stop the cascade? So we do know that there are people who have two mutations, damaging mutations. And um, one of those uh, corrections may provide some benefit. I think probably the best example is there is a myosin binding protein C missense mutation, very, very rare, that is commonly found in um, the Northern European population. About 4% of the population carries it. And we often see that one with 
another much more potent mutation. If we look at the people who just have the mild one, they're much better than the people with both. So yes, potentially, Lisa, if you corrected the worst, um, presumably you would mitigate against disease, which would be good. Wow. Okay. A lot, lot of heady science tonight, people. A lot of heady science. Okay. So we answered that question. If anybody has any other questions, please post them now. Facebook, I'm going to say thank you and good evening. And uh, we appreciate you watching us on Facebook. Uh, if you want to watch the rebroadcast, please check YouTube in about 48 hours and it'll be there. Okay.